This is WBCQ, bringing world's last chance radio to you from Monticello, Maine, USA. Violent crime, political unrest, financial instability. Everything points to an impending crisis, a crisis like no other. Tune in to World's Last Chance Radio to learn how you can spiritually prepare for what lies ahead. WLC Radio, preparing a people for the Saviour's imminent return. Every Sunday, hundreds of millions who profess to be Christian assume they are being correctly taught and that they understand and believe the truth of the Bible. In reality, almost no one knows even the most basic teachings of God's Word or of Jesus Christ. Almost all worship Jesus according to what is commonly believed, without the slar unknown to Christianity, and so is the meaning of nearly everything Jesus taught. This is part one of two broadcasts covering 20 verses that virtually the whole of Christendom either misunderstands, ignores, or rejects outright. Prepare to learn the truth and to be shocked at what you thought you knew. Over 100 million Bibles are sold or given away each year, with 92% of American households having one. Such statistics show it is the world's bestseller, yet, ironically, it is also the world's least understood book. All the verses you are about to see are ignored and rejected by professing Christianity. Ministers and experienced Bible students know of these passages, but choose to explain them away or never speak of them. Most religious leaders have chosen to disregard what the Bible teaches. It is as though many fear the truth or to tell the truth. They fear being fired for teaching it, and they fear their members will leave if they do. In all cases, they fear what men may say or do, and give little or no thought to what God declares in His Word. The majority of ministers appear to be of God. They profess to believe God wrote the Bible. Yet, not understanding it, they twist verses to fit preconceived ideas. In fact, theological institutes and seminaries of this world have developed a systematic way, and this can be done consciously or unconsciously, of spinning or dismissing God's plain words and plain meaning in favor of making passages appear to say what they need them to say. These theologians and religionists sell false teachings through use of specific verses, wrongly understood and often taken out of context, that supposedly support their ideas. This permits them to come from a basis of supposed Bible authority for beliefs, and it helps them to much more easily snare the unwitting and unwary. If one is properly trained and sufficiently grounded in the truth of the Bible, it is quite easy to see through and expose the deceptive logic misapplied to a verse and to correctly explain it. The Apostle Paul warned of dishonest people who handle the Word of God deceitfully, because they, like their listeners willing to believe them, receive not the love of the truth. True ministers never, under any circumstances, follow these practices. What follows is simple, and the verses quoted are seen to be not open to human interpretation. While the Bible is a long and sometimes complex book, the verses we will cover can be easily understood. The truths they bring will be impossible to miss. Some background is necessary that introduces all that follows. Blame for deception cannot be laid solely at the feet of modern Christendom. There is another source which drives the thinking of the whole world. It is key to understanding why basic truths of the Bible remain hidden. This sets up the first verse Christianity just leaves out, Revelation 12.9. This passage requires a little longer explanation. Now let's read it. 
The great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. This verse is completely ignored by professing Christianity. Have you ever heard it from the pulpit of your church? As the one who deceives all nations, including ministers, Satan is ultimately responsible. His deception is extremely subtle. But of course, God also holds people accountable. Ephesians references the devil's worldwide influence. In time past, the Apostle Paul wrote, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. Grasp this. Satan uses the air to broadcast through his spirit, an attitude of disobedience. His spirit sends moods, feelings, and attitudes of hostility into people's minds. These work, as it says, to bring disobedience. This airwave control gives the devil tremendous power, allowing him to send thoughts of deceit, anger, pride, hatred, vanity, jealousy, lust, greed, envy, and confusion into people's minds. The devil is much more powerful than most realize. Look at the position he holds and what this permits him to do. The God of this world, it says, has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ should shine unto them. Satan blinds and deceives on a staggering scale. The result is a world filled with disobedience or lawlessness. His cunning has been so seductive, he has even been able to convince many that he does not exist. Like Christians guided by God's Spirit, the children of disobedience are also inspired and guided by a spirit, that of this world's God. Satan broadcasts a spirit of rebellion against and disobedience to God's law. The devil portrays his ministers as though they represent God and teach his truth. Notice, Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness. A deceived world is blissfully ignorant of this understanding and pays the price. The second verse, Isaiah 59.2, is related to Revelation 12.9. Let's read it. Your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Mankind is cut off from God because of its sin. Adding Jeremiah 5.25 makes this clearer. Grasp the implications. This is not God's world. It is cut off from him, held captive by an unseen kidnapper. All of humanity has been deceived into believing the soothing words of this great captor, thinking themselves better off under his care and leadership. 6,000 years ago, the devil first captured Adam and Eve, and as a result, all inhabitants of earth ever after. However, the world has remained a willing captive ever since and remains cut off from God. The third verse Christianity disregards is the definition of sin. 1 John 3, 4. Whosoever commits sin transgresses also the law. Get this, for sin is the transgression of the law. This is one of the greatest points in the Bible. The difference between what God approves and what he does not. There have been endless ideas about the definition of sin, what it is and is not. Yet the Bible defines it with surprising simplicity. When someone transgresses or breaks the law, he has sinned. When one breaks man's laws, he earns a penalty, such as a fine, jail time, or worse for capital offenses. Likewise, when we violate the laws of God, we earn a penalty. The wages of sin is death, the Bible says. Wages are something you earn as a payment for what you have done. If you sin, break God's law, you will die eternally. Suddenly, knowing what constitutes God's law is of extreme importance. The subject of what is God's law has been twisted and mangled. Greater churchianity, as I call it, has blurred this concept beyond recognition. However, this need not be complicated. This leads us to the next few verses that Christianity just blows off. 
The fourth verse never talked about in Christendom is Matthew 5.17, where Jesus said, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. The word fulfill means to verify, fully preach, perfect, fill to the full. In other words, Jesus came to verify and perfect the Ten Commandments, to expand their meaning. Matthew 5 is then filled with examples of how the Ten Commandments have been made even more binding today. For instance, Jesus said, It was said by them of old time, You shall not kill, but I say that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Instead of abolishing the commandments, Jesus magnified them. Read Isaiah 42 and verse 21. Ministers of this world twist these and other scriptures to sidestep and reject Jesus' plain meaning about the importance of keeping God's law. They dismiss clear verses, such as Paul's statement, do we then make void the law through faith, as most today claim? Paul adds, God forbid, yes, we establish the law. This leads to the fifth overlooked verse, and it is crucial. 1 John 5, 3. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous or burdensome. Many who claim to have love believe God's commandments are grievous. God declares otherwise. Paul called God's law holy, just, good, and spiritual. The Psalms say it is perfect, sure, right, and pure. Blessings flow from keeping God's commands. Ancient Israel was instructed to keep them because with the whole Bible, they form his instruction manual on how to live. God's word reveals the only way to achieve a truly successful, happy, and abundant life. The sixth verse takes this connection further. Romans 13.10 Love works no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Get this, the Bible defines love as obedience to God's law. It is that simple. There's no ambiguity or confusion, yet most are ignorant of the true definition of love. Ministers everywhere speak endlessly about God's love while completely missing all of these vital scriptures that define it. Jesus also said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Nowhere does Jesus say, he who professes to love me yet breaks my commandments still loves me. If you are among the two billion who profess to be Christian, and someone asks you whether you love Jesus Christ, you would surely answer yes. But how would you prove it? What evidence could you provide? To most, love is little more than a vague idea that cannot be defined. Everything from a feeling in the heart to just doing good. A wide range of ideas exist, because few consult the only source that provides an absolute definition. The first four commandments, not serving false gods, not making or worshiping images or idols of God, not taking God's name in vain and observing the Sabbath, reveal how to love God. The remaining six, honor father and mother, do not kill, commit adultery, steal, bear false witness, or covet, reveal how to love other human beings. When one obeys God's law, he automatically practices love toward God and others. Love is easily demonstrated because action is required. When one obeys any of the last six commandments, he, knowingly or not, is outwardly indicating love toward his fellow man. Consider adultery. Though vast numbers break the seventh commandment, most would agree adultery is not showing love toward one's spouse. Now think of the devastation that results. Broken trust, marriages, homes, relationships with children, and more. By faithfulness, spouses show love toward each other. Similarly, obeying commands 1 to 4 show love toward God. Sadly, most don't even know these laws and thus do not truly love God, despite what they may proclaim. The seventh passage that most outright reject is in Mark 7. As you read, ask if you have ever heard it quoted by a minister. Jesus said this to the Pharisees, 
Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. He added, Laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups, and many other such like things you do. Full well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your own tradition. This is a strong indictment of the religious elite of that time. Jesus stated that the Pharisees professed to worship God, but inside they were far from him. The context was they sought opportunity to accuse him and his disciples of breaking their tradition, the commandments of men, merely because they didn't wash their hands when they ate. The disciples were not breaking any laws of God. Jesus labeled the Pharisees' worship vain, meaning to no purpose or fruitless. While God does authorize use of traditions, 2 Thessalonians 2.15, they never supplant or contradict his laws. The Pharisees, like so many today, claim to know God. The Apostle John wrote, He that says, I know him, and keeps not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Today's religious elite reject God's instructions and instead teach and hold to popular traditions. Christmas, Easter, Halloween, Sunday keeping, the false Trinitarian God, the false gospel about Jesus instead of the kingdom of God, the fictions that God's law was nailed to the cross, tithing is done away, the saved go to heaven, and a host of other traditions. In fact, virtually all the teachings of Orthodox Christianity are man-made. Like the Pharisees, the world's ministers preach false doctrines and lead people away from God. If Jesus were here today, he would indict these ministers in the same manner. Ask yourself whether you are worshiping Jesus Christ in vain. Do not assume his warning only applies to others. Assume it could mean you. Investigate why you believe as you do, why you observe popular traditions. The eighth passage, rarely even mentioned by ministers, is in James 2. First, understand that some assert keeping the Ten Commandments is legalistic, merely because salvation is by grace. How do grace and obedience to God connect to salvation? And does obeying the law, your works, mean you're trying to earn salvation. Now, James, faith, if it has not works, is dead, being alone. You have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. But will you know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Regarding Abraham, see you how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. Most assume that grace and works are mutually exclusive. The Bible says no such thing. In fact, God's Word demonstrates both are required. Think of salvation in this way. A wealthy father approaches his son heading off to college with this offer. Son, upon graduation, I will give you $1 million if you maintain a B average, never get drunk, and never cut classes. Ask. If the young man meets these conditions, will he receive the million dollars? Yes. Has his conduct earned him the money? No, of course not. He merely did what all young men should do at college. Yet he would not receive the million dollars if he did not meet the preconditions, the qualifiers. Salvation is the same. Of course, God offers far more than a million dollars, but only those who obey Him, who qualify, may receive His offer. Why cannot millions of Christians understand such basic logic? There is nothing one can do to earn salvation. It is completely a gift from God. No amount of commandment-keeping can atone for violating God's law. Only Jesus' blood can do this. However, reward in the next life after receiving salvation is determined by your works. 
The commandments describe personal responsibility, what you must do. Yet, when fully understood, obedience is not you doing it, but rather Christ in you, who will keep the same commandments he did when in the flesh 2,000 years ago. Don't accept the reasoning of men. Examine the pages of your Bible. All of James 2 discusses how faith and works go hand in hand toward achieving salvation and eternal reward. Christians demonstrate faith in God by doing good works and keeping His law, yet it requires Christ's faith working in them to succeed. The ninth verse is Matthew 4.4. 4. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Most Christians do not study their Bibles, never mind diligently. They do not use God's Word as His instruction manual. They do not live the Bible. They do not study to show themselves approved unto God or rightly divide the Word of Truth. If they did, especially this world's ministers, broadcasts like this would be unnecessary. Everyone would already understand all these verses. Fifty years ago, a newspaper article exposed Christians' ignorance of the Bible. Since then, this has worsened. This article begins, Some months ago, a Protestant pastor administered a Bible quiz to the members of his congregation. The questions were very simple. Anyone with a general knowledge of the Bible should have been able to answer all of them easily. The results staggered the pastor. Only 5% of his flock, it continues, made a commendable grade on the test. 15% failed to give a single correct answer. 60% were unable to name the four Gospels. 75% could not identify Calvary, Golgotha, as the place where Jesus was crucified. The vast majority of Americans today are Bible illiterates. They simply have never read the book which they profess to regard as the Word of God. So sadly true. The reporter concluded, A great many people have turned away from the Bible because when they do try to read it, they find they cannot understand it. To the modern reader, it has a remote and antiquarian flavor. It is likely to leave him with the impression the Bible is an ancient history book that has no real relevance to his life here and now. End of quote. Society almost considers biblical knowledge irrelevant. J.B. Phillips of the Phillips Bible Translation wrote this, It is one of the curious phenomena of modern times that it is considered perfectly respectable to be abysmally ignorant of the Christian faith. Men and women who would be deeply ashamed of having their ignorance exposed in matters of poetry, music, or painting, for example, are not in the least perturbed to be found ignorant of the New Testament. I would add they are even more ignorant of the Old Testament. The Bible of a true Christian is not gathering dust on a shelf. He is daily studying it, every word from God's mouth. The tenth passage that is ignored by virtually every professing Christian relates to this entire broadcast. In Matthew 24, 4 and 5, Jesus warned, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, I am the Messiah, and shall deceive many. The first many here are the vast majority of thought-to-be Christian ministers who proclaim Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, but who do not believe or teach what He taught. Neither do they come with His authority. Six verses later, Jesus added, Many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Not only would false prophets deceive the great majority, they would also infiltrate the true church, Christ warned, causing many true Christians to fall away. During the last days, false prophets were foretold to increase in number and in their power to deceive. Here is Jesus' chilling warning. There shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders. You must understand the power, influence, and grave danger presented by false prophets and false teachers, and grasp what it means to you. There are many deceivers at work today. 
But how many are taking heed, as Jesus said? How many are doing their homework on something so vital? How many are carefully examining those claiming to represent God? The Bible says prophets fall into one of two categories, true or false. All, past, present, or future, are one or the other. They cannot be both, and they cannot be in between. Within the category of false prophets are two types. Those who claim to be a prophet, but falsely foretell events, not being inspired by the true God. And those who do not necessarily claim to be a prophet, but who teach falsely about prophecy, and for that matter, any other aspect of God's Word. The latter would include false teachers and false ministers. Like false prophets, false teachers assert they are vested with God's authority. Rather than falsely prophesying future events, they teach false doctrines supposedly from the Bible. Therefore, Jesus' warnings also apply to false teachers who work in the same way. Understand, on the surface, false prophets rarely appear to be what they are. They are incredibly seductive and seem to be men of God. We saw that effective deceivers have the ability to almost miraculously transform themselves into something they are not. This is how they're able to deceive so many. Think of popular televangelists and religious personalities. The most famous are invariably the smoothest in style, tone, emphasis, body language, and word choice. These men come off as sincere and believable. The result is that thousands sit in stadiums mesmerized by these religious actors. In fact, some could win an Academy Award if they were actors. The New Testament describes how false ministers and false prophets attempt to confuse even God's people. Therefore, God must show exactly how to distinguish the true from the false, the genuine from the imposters. Many verses do this. God allows no room for doubt or confusion. Jesus said, Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. If such men appeared as vicious wolves, who would follow them? Because they can portray themselves as men of God, some masterfully, Fooling many is easier than taking candy from a baby. Do not let them fool you. We have examined 10 verses that should now be impossible to misunderstand. While the Christian world either rejects, never discusses, or spiritualizes away their true meaning, don't you. Part 2 examines 10 more verses. Do not miss it. World's Last Chance has produced more than 1,500 documentaries in over 30 languages. Visit our website at worldslastchance.com or look for WLC videos on YouTube. New documentaries on a variety of important topics are being released all the time. Get started watching and learn the truth while you still have the chance at worldslastchance.com. Did you know that when the Savior was on earth, the Jews did not use the Julian calendar for calculating the Sabbath? They really didn't. At that time, the Julian calendar had an eight-day week. The Jews still used the lunisolar calendar of creation for calculating their days of worship. The facts of history prove that the calendar used today comes from paganism. This is important because most people calculate their days of worship by the Papal Gregorian calendar, which itself comes directly from the Pagan Julian calendar. If you would like to learn more about this fascinating but little known fact of history, read all about it on our website, worldslastchance.com. Read the article, The Modern Seven Day Week, Exploring the History of a Lie. You'll be shocked at what you learn. Read The Modern Seven-Day Week, Exploring the History of a Lie on worldslastchance.com. You deserve to know the truth.
Modern Christendom twists, perverts, and ignores the many plain truths of the Bible. Over the last 2,000 years, it has counterfeited every true doctrine and replaced it with a cheap substitute. This has been possible because certain more difficult-to-understand passages can be easily misrepresented to say something they do not. It is these verses that invariably become the vehicle through which a false doctrine can be introduced. With almost no one able to recognize, it all may have begun with a single wrong scriptural premise. Unaware of the most crucial rule of Bible study? Most Bible students do not build their understanding by beginning with the clearest verses on any subject. Instead, they enter God's Word with preconceived ideas and search for passages that appear to support what they have assumed the Bible teaches. This makes them candidates for confusion and deception. Here are ten more verses that Christianity ignores. The Apostle Peter stated that the Apostle Paul wrote some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest or twist, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. Completely unaware of any of the rules of Bible study, but understanding how most people think, teachers and scholars can take advantage of the way certain parts of God's Word are written. This applies to verses beyond what Paul wrote. One of the greatest truths about which ministers have deceived billions is the gospel. This introduces the 11th verse largely unnoticed by Christians, Mark 1, 14 and 15. Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent you and believe the gospel. The most butchered teaching in the Bible is also the most fundamental. Different denominations have invented gospels of healing, salvation, and grace, to name a few. But the biggest false gospel is the one focusing on Christ, the messenger, instead of his message. Gospel means good news, and this news is far greater than today's wrong focus about Christ. The word gospel is found 101 times throughout the Bible. Sometimes it's alone or with kingdom, kingdom of God, or kingdom of heaven, not kingdom in heaven. Since kingdom is a King James term meaning government and of denotes possession, kingdom of God can be written as government of God or God's government. The gospel of the kingdom of God can be expressed as the good news of God's government. How plain. Jesus announced the good news that God's government was coming to earth. He did not speak about himself. Notice. Jesus said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. He that speaks of himself seeks his own glory. God takes the truth of the gospel seriously. Paul warned the first century church and all Christians thereafter that some would pervert the gospel of Christ. He twice declared that any who do are cursed. This is a sobering warning. God demands the true gospel be taught. Jesus Christ and Christians through the ages were put to death for this message. Christians are in training for positions in a new and different government. The twelfth verse rejected by Christianity is Revelation 18.4. God commands, Come out of Babylon, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. Babylon means confusion. The true servants of God have come out of this world and its Babylonish religions, ways, and governments. They have left behind its teachings, division, strife, and confusion. Paul wrote, Come out from among them, meaning the world, and be you separate. Let's understand. Just before his crucifixion, Jesus reflected in a prayer a central principle to his disciples. I pray not that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through your truth, your word is truth. It is the truth that sets Christians apart or sanctifies them from everyone around them. They are not of this world and its ways, 
customs, beliefs, and traditions. They have come out of it, leaving all of its values, ideas, and philosophies behind. Christians cannot live in caves or as hermits. Some religious zealots misunderstand Christ and enter monasteries or retreats to avoid contact with people. Jesus never did this. He did not mean come out of the physical world, but rather its system of governments and religions. Christians practice and believe the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth of God's Word, not popular ideas, any of them. Although widely missed, the identity of the Old Testament God is found in the New Testament. This introduces the 13th passage Christianity just leaves out, 1 Corinthians 10, verses 3 and 4. They did all eat the same spiritual meat, ancient Israel, and did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. This is plain. Jesus Christ is the God of both the Old and New Testaments. In both Testaments, Jesus is described as the God who never changes. Read Malachi 3 and verse 6 and Hebrews 13, 8. New Testament teachings reflect the Old. In part one, we saw the law of God, the Ten Commandments, is still binding on Christians today. What happens when we die, what sin is, the true gospel, and so many more doctrines are in complete agreement when compared to the Old Testament. If these verses were not ignored, they would point to the true God of the Bible and in turn to the primary purpose of the New Testament, the establishment and building of God's church. The 14th verse describes how Christ built one church, Matthew 16, 18. I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Stating it would never disappear, Jesus promised to build his church, singular, not the mass confusion of hundreds of fighting and competing churches which seemingly cannot agree on anything. Your job is to seek out and find one church, Jesus' church. It is only from that church you will receive true spiritual nourishment, which will allow you to develop and grow in godly character. Now ask, why are you hearing these verses now in this broadcast? Jesus built His church to carry out His commission, and only one fulfills all New Testament requirements. It is that church from which you are learning the truth, including about basic Bible verses. The 15th verse is Mark 2, 27 and 28. The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. No other doctrine is as widely accepted and staunchly defended in the world of traditional Christianity than Sunday keeping. If asked which day is the Christian Sabbath, most answer Sunday. Some falsely believe Jesus rose from the dead that day, so we honor Jesus by observing Sunday. Numerous clever arguments exist as to why Sunday is supposedly the day Christians should assemble and worship God. This unbiblical practice has been in effect so long, over 1,600 years, and is so common that few are able or willing to recognize clear scriptures that reveal the true Sabbath day and its permanence. Most start with Sunday as the Christian Sabbath and then search for verses to support this idea, if they study at all, rather than beginning with an open mind and searching for clear passages on the subject, of which there are many. Even a quick study of the topic with an open mind will reveal the truth. Sadly, most are too steeped in the popular tradition of men to leave Sunday's powerful grip. How many times have you glossed over Mark 2, 27 and 28? Or have you, if be honest? Jesus' statement is simple to understand when one considers who created the Sabbath day. As the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it, not Sunday, he had rested from all his work. Jesus' why did not say he is Lord of Sunday. 
Some cite Matthew 12, a parallel account of Mark 2, as proof Jesus did away with the Sabbath. Yet Jesus was explaining that it is lawful for a person to satisfy immediate hunger on the Sabbath, as David did, even though it was not lawful for anyone other than the Levites to eat the showbread. 1 Samuel 21, verses 1 to 6, you may read. The Pharisees concocted numerous man-made regulations governing the Sabbath that made it a burden on people rather than a blessing. This is what Christ condemned, not the day itself. How do we know? Because the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Jesus Christ created the Sabbath for people to enjoy. The Sabbath is to serve man, not the other way around. The Pharisees made it into a day one must serve, thus making it a burden. The only difference today is that misguided religious leaders have made it of no effect at all. Resist shallow arguments that the Sabbath was only for the Jews or Jesus did away with it. This day has been in effect as holy time since the foundation of the world. Man has no authority to establish or take away time that God made holy. Many will argue they keep the Sabbath in their hearts or in Jesus. Similar to other plain Bible realities like the kingdom of God, the Sabbath is spiritualized away. Human reasoning permits a person to keep the Sabbath as he or she sees fit rather than as God commands. Read Exodus 20, verses 8 to 11. What God wants is ignored. They make his law of no effect, just like the Pharisees. The 16th verse virtually no one considers is Romans 8, 14. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. This verse defines a true Christian, and a few verses earlier, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, get this, he is none of his. A Christian is one who has the Holy Spirit. It's that simple. How one acquires the Spirit of Christ begins in Mark, which we read earlier. Repent you and believe the gospel. One of Jesus' first commands is to repent, which means to change. This is the perfect summary of Christianity. It is a life of constant change, from a carnal mind to one taking on the character of God. As the second step in the Christian walk, it should now be clear why our opening verse about the gospel is crucial, that you must believe in the only gospel Christ preached the kingdom of God. Peter's sermon in Acts 2 adds another element. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. One must be baptized to receive the Holy Spirit. Time and again, clear verses reveal the core teachings of the Bible. The 17th passage Christians reject flat out is John 3.13. No man has ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. The most universally misunderstood Bible truth is what happens when you die, whether one goes to heaven or hell for eternity or something else. Countless millions believe and hear their ministers preach that we must believe in Jesus so we can enter heaven and ride clouds, play harps, walk the streets of gold in front of the pearly gates, sit in rocking chairs, or just roll around heaven all day. Nearly everyone believes they will go to heaven upon death. Yet Jesus plainly declares no one has ascended there. No one means no one. Now notice what Peter stated. Let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. This is plain. We might ask, if David didn't make heaven, who did or who does? You might next wonder, if no one is in heaven, then what is a Christian's reward? Jesus stated, I go back to heaven to prepare a place for you. Most assume he's referring to preparing a place in heaven. Yet in the very next verse, he said, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again to earth and receive you unto myself, that where I am, 
on earth, there you may be also. Combine this with, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And the truth is clear. The reward of God's saints is future rulership on the earth as kings and priests. Reading Revelation 5.10 makes this obvious. Right now, Jesus is in heaven preparing a kingdom for his people to inherit on earth. Christians will not join Jesus in heaven. He will come again to earth where they join him. So few understand this fundamental Bible teaching. This is because they ignore and reject plain scriptures. Will you believe the plain words of Jesus Christ? Will you believe his statement, no man has ascended up to heaven? The 18th verse Christianity dismisses is John 3.3. 3. Its explanation is longer. Jesus told Nicodemus, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. For one to see God's kingdom, he must be born again. There's no other way. This confused Nicodemus. He could not understand how a human being could experience a second birth. Nicodemus said, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? This is certainly a fair question, one that would naturally come to mind when learning one must be born a second time. It is widely taught and believed that to be a true Christian, one must be born again by religious experience. Millions of professing Christians define themselves as having undergone this experience, claiming it occurs when one accepts Jesus as Savior. Being born again is reduced to a feeling rather than an actual birth. A series of Jesus statements in John are used to support this popular teaching. First, Jesus expounds on his verse 3 statement, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Water applies to baptism, being fully immersed in water, which symbolizes a person's old self being buried in a watery grave. The person is then raised from the water as a new man and is to live the rest of his life in obedience to God. In effect, such a person is born of water. This also refers to the physical birth common to all human beings. While in the mother's womb, a baby is surrounded and protected by a water-like liquid called amniotic fluid. This cushions the baby to keep it safe and protected from infection. Just before birth, this water breaks, signaling delivery will be soon. Everyone can say he has experienced this birth, but the next one is different. Jesus' mention of the Spirit references the moment of being born again or born of the Spirit. Again, most believe this happens when one accepts Jesus, while they remain flesh and blood human beings. Jesus' next statement, That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. How clear! This means it is impossible for a flesh and blood person to be born again. Those born of the flesh or of a woman are flesh, period. But those born of the Holy Spirit are spirit, period. Jesus removes all doubt. Marvel not that I said unto you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it lists, and you hear the sound thereof, but cannot tell whence it comes and where it goes. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. You should not marvel either. Jesus compared those born again to wind. We can see and feel the effects of wind, trees swaying, debris being tossed through the air, etc., but cannot see wind itself. Likewise, when an individual is born of the Spirit, other human beings will not be able to see him because he will be composed of spirit, not flesh and blood. God is a spirit and cannot be seen. We have to ask, of those who claim to be born again, are any of them spirit beings? No, they are still flesh. Sadly, they wrongly assume they're born again despite Jesus' plain teaching. When is one truly born again? At the resurrection of the dead, when Jesus returns in full power and glory. Let's read. As in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive, but every man in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, 
afterward they that are Christ's, get this, at his coming. Christians are born again at his coming, not before. What happens at the resurrection? Paul wrote, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, the moment of Christ's return. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal body from human birth must put on immortality, a divine body at spirit birth. One verse prior, Paul had stated, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Those who believe they are born again and in the kingdom of God now, while in the flesh, err. Human beings cannot inherit God's kingdom before they have been changed, born again into spirit beings. Will you believe your Bible or cling to traditions of men? The 19th verse ignored by Christianity is Revelation 1.1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. Understand, the events recorded in the book of Revelation are for God's servants to understand. Who are God's servants? They are those who obey him. This will become more clear. Mark 4 and Matthew 13 add understanding to how Jesus teaches. In both places, he explained that he spoke in parables so his servants would understand him, but others would not. Let's carefully read. When he was alone with only the disciples, they that were about him with the twelve asked of him the parable, and he said unto them, not to others or the world as a whole, unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables, that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand. Note exactly what Jesus said. Only his servants could grasp his real meaning. Others might think they do, but cannot. Jesus Christ never leaves his followers in the dark about matters he wants them to understand, but he does record them in ways that keep them hidden from the view of all others. This will help you see why so few understand a book that has been read by so many. Those who have God's Spirit will understand the book of Revelation and all truth. Read Acts 5.32 and John 16.13. Accepting these two verses is vital to every viewer and reader of Revelation. All who do not obey God, however sincere in pursuing the truth of Bible prophecy or anything else, are wasting their time. The 20th verse that Christendom never speaks of is Luke 21, 36, and it is powerful. Watch you, therefore, and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. What are true Christians told to escape? Jesus foretold that immediately preceding his return, great prophecies would slam into a completely unsuspecting, unprepared world. He had just said, as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole world earth. This coming world punishment is called the Great Tribulation, including the year-long Day of the Lord. Many verses speak of these earth-shattering events and in much greater detail than most could dream. Yet almost none concern themselves with conditions and events that Jesus plainly states will affect everyone and how one can escape all. The Bible's meaning and purpose is always greater than what men concoct. Now ask, why have you not been taught these 20 verses? How can such amazing understanding, so obvious in the Bible, remain hidden and for so long? Believe me, there is much more that has been hidden that we could cover. Your eyes have been opened to truths closed to others. Will you believe these verses? or common misconceptions and errors taught about them throughout supposed Christianity? Will you return to deception or act on what you have learned? 
The right choice means learning many more marvelous truths from God's instruction manual for mankind. Get started on the journey. Time is short. There's a popular teaching in Christianity that the divine law was nailed to the cross with Yahushua. This is interpreted to mean that the divine law no longer needs to be kept. And truthfully, something was nailed to the cross, but it wasn't the Ten Commandments. WLC invites you to do a careful study of Colossians 2. Learn the truth of what was nailed to the cross, what was not, and the significance for Christians today. Go to worldslastchance.com and read What Was Nailed to the Cross? An Examination of Colossians 2. Again, that's What Was Nailed to the Cross on worldslastchance.com because what you don't know can hurt you. Hearing how Yahweh has blessed others is always a wonderful encouragement. Do you have an experience or a testimony that could encourage and bless others? We would love to hear it. Visit our website at worldslastchance.com. Your faith can be strengthened as you read the experience of others who have been saved, and your own testimony can strengthen still more. worldslastchance.com let us rejoice with you in Yahweh's wonderful deliverance in your life. been listening to WLC Radio. Join us again tomorrow for another truth-filled message on WBCQ at 93.30 kilohertz on the 31 meter band. World's Last Chance Radio, preparing a people for the Saviour's soon return. Mm-hmm.